We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Current evolutionary theories are proclaimed as beyond question in the name of science. But a closer look reveals the reasons for adherence to the paradigm are philosophical rather than empirical. While truth cannot contradict truth, bad science tends to follow bad philosophy. And this is what we see again and again in the writings of Kenneth Miller and other leading evolutionists. It too has turned out at last to be no more than a godless ideology masquerading in scientific God. Here's a simple way of saying it. We're not going up, we're not evolving upward, we're going down. Given the real testimony of the fossil record, most of the geologic column is best interpreted as being laid down quickly and as a result of a global flood. No scientist would ever accept divine intervention in the formation of first humans, and yet theistic evolution has little meaning if God is fenced out. Hey, welcome everybody. Steve Cunningham with Sense of Fidelity. I'm coming at you on the 31st of January 2020, St. John Bosco Day, with the Foundations Restored and K uh, Colby Setter and Dr. Kevin Mark and, well, almost everybody off the team. So anyways, Dr. Kevin, let's tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, I live in Killarney, Manitoba, Canada, and I have been a Catholic for, um, I don't know, I guess we're at about four years now. And... Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about this Foundations Restored uh, DVD project because it is really close to my heart. One of the things that kept me from the Catholic Church was the fact that I thought all Catholics were evolutionists until I found the Colby Center. And I had already come to the conclusion that evolution was impossible. So being able to teach people uh, the stuff that is in this series is just amazing to me. Very good. And uh, yeah, if you guys get to watch the shows, you'll see Dr. Mark on there, along with the narrator, Keith Jones. Keith, welcome and tell us a little bit about you. Uh, yeah, so I am a uh, video producer uh, currently living in the distressful state of California with my family. I've got seven children and um, this project, Foundations Restored, has really been sort of the magnus opum, I guess you could say, of everything that I've ever done uh, in, in my career. And so I'm, I'm very happy to have found the Colby Center and Hugh Owen and to be a part of it. And everybody knows Hugh, I think, uh, outside of Father Ripper and uh, Father W, I think Hugh's the most watched guy on my channel and, or most videos. So Hugh, what is... Foundations Restored, and why did you decide to make it? Well, the, the title really does sum up the project because the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation is the foundation of our faith. And St. David says in the Psalms, foundations destroyed, what can the just man do? And what we've seen in the last 150 years is the systematic destruction of the foundations of the Catholic faith by introducing 
the idea that the sacred history of Genesis is, is not a history, but is some kind of poetry or mythology. And little by little, the devil has been able to convince the majority of the intellectual elite of the Catholic Church that this is the case and that natural science has taught us that God's revelation in the sacred history of Genesis, as it was understood in God's church from the beginning, is not true. And that it ha our interpretation of the sacred history of Genesis has to be reinterpreted in the light of modern science. And this is why Pope St. Pius X in the encyclical Pascendi in 1907 warned us that we now have in the church the worst heresy in the history of Christianity, modernism, the synthesis of all heresies. But he goes on to say that evolution is the principal doctrine of the modernists. Now, tradition-minded Catholics all over the world know that modernism is the synthesis of all heresies, but how many have read or reflected on those words that evolution is the principal doctrine of the modernists. And yet it's true. And this is why this DVD series is called Foundations Restored, because the DVD series demonstrates that sound theology, sound philosophy, and sound natural science all confirm the traditional doctrine of the church on creation and completely refute the molecules to man evolutionary mythology in both its theistic and its atheistic form. In the Catholic community recognizes this fact that evolution is the foundation of modernism and of the whole culture of death and goes back to and restores and helps to restore by God's grace the true foundations of the Catholic faith, that's when we're going to see the total eradication of the anti-culture of death, the end of this terrible unprecedented crisis of faith and morals, and the restoration of the faith and the greatest evangelization that the world has ever seen in that era of peace promised by Our Lady of Fatima. Now for our listeners under 30, that was a telephone that was ringing. Yeah, those things still <laughs> exist. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, what do you uh, what do you expect the series to accomplish, and what could people learn to ex expect to learn from it? Um, I think really what we are hoping for ultimately is nothing less than a complete turnaround in the Catholic Church. We are seriously um, hoping, believing, and praying that this is going to touch hearts and going to allow people to. Uh, recognize that many of the people in the church right now are attempting to evolve doctrine. And this kind of stems from this false belief that biological evolution is true, therefore evolutionism of all types is true. So we're really hoping that we can um, really um, kind of get back to where the church should be back to before um, all of this error began to creep in. And um, we are really um, confident that people who watch this series are going to um, be able to recognize the various errors that um, have crept into the church through evolutionism. So in terms of um, what um, people can expect to learn, um, it goes into, the series goes into um, the theistic side of things with respect to the errors of evolutionism, uh, biological evolutionism, and then um, what probably people will find the most interesting are some of the consequences that have flowed out from belief in biological evolutionism, which is um, kind of the social moral, liturgical evolutionism that has um, 
come into uh, the church and into society and how we can see some of the things like contraception, sterilization, eugenics, etc., that really do have this basis uh, in evolutionism. Hugh? Yes, I agree with that entirely. And one of the things that I think Catholics who are trying to hold fast to the traditional faith really will appreciate and learn from this series is that the crisis of faith and the attack on the foundations of the faith began long before the Second Vatican Council, but even before the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, recently, we published a newsletter and drew attention to the fact that the most successful propagandist for microbe to man evolution after Darwin, or in the, in the time of Darwin, was not Charles Darwin, it was the German anatomist Ernst Haeckel. And uh, Dr. Kevin Mark actually gave me an amazing piece of writing that Ernst Haeckel wrote in 1906, in which he was reflecting on his struggle over the previous 30 or 40 years to win acceptance for this micro to man evolution hypothesis. And one of the things that's so remarkable about this document is where Ernst Haeckel zeroes in on what he calls evolution's greatest triumph. And you know what evolution's greatest triumph was according to the most effective propagandist for molecules to man evolution? The greatest triumph of evolution, according to Ernst Haeckel, was when the church, and specifically the Catholic church, went over from being totally opposed to this evolutionary doctrine, as totally antithetical mm -hmm. to the fundamental doctrine of creation and the sacred history of Genesis, to within a period of 30 years embracing it and trying to integrate evolution into the church's teaching. This is what the most effective propagandist for evolutionary mythology ever identified as evolution's greatest triumph. And who does he identify as the principal agents of this transformation within the Catholic community? The Jesuits. He names names and identifies the Jesuits as the ones who turned things around within Catholic academia. And he even says something very ironic. He points out that in the immediate aftermath of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, one of the reasons why Blessed Pope Pius IX and Pope Leo XIII did not see the necessity of handing down an anathema explicitly against evolution was because Blessed Pope Pius IX considered this microbe to man evolution theory to be so absurd that it wasn't worth taking seriously. And yet, Heckel points out that 30 years after the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, there were so many Catholic intellectuals who were saying, who, who says that we were ever against this idea? We, we've been, we never said there was anything about evolution that couldn't be reconciled with the Catholic faith. And he laughs because he remembers that when Darwin's book came out, the Catholics were on the front lines saying that this idea of microbe to man evolution was completely absurd, that it not only had no support in natural science, but that it was completely contradicted by the testimony of all the traditions of all the peoples all over the earth who have a living memory or until industrialization and urbanization, every people group on earth had a living memory 
of the one God who created the world, of the original couple, of a, an original state of perfection that was lost through some kind of sin, of a global flood that destroyed everyone earth, on earth except for one family, of a Tower of Babel incident when languages were confused. And for Blessed Pope Pius IX and Orestes Brownson here in the United States, the greatest apologist for the Catholic faith that this country has ever produced, Darwin was a joke. Because as Orestes Brownson said, Mr. Darwin, you want to go against the constant teaching of God's church and the testimony of all of mankind handed down from generation to generation for thousands of years, Mr. Darwin, if you expect us to take, take you seriously, before we will even sit down at the table with you, you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that your wild conjectures are worthy of being taken seriously. And that was the attitude of Blessed Pope Pius IX and the Magisterium of the Catholic Church when Darwin's book, Origin of Species, was first published. But Heckel was so effective as a propagandist that within the space of 30 years, he was able to win over many of the leading Catholic intellectuals. And this leads to another very important point. Within the community of Catholics who are trying to hold fast to tradition, the majority are still holding to the view that while microbe to man evolution is false and is philosophically absurd, the long ages of Lyellian geology and even the Big Bang cosmology of Monsignor Lemaitre are perfectly access ac acceptable. And these uh, men and, and women of goodwill will point to the theological manuals that were in use in the 1920s and the 1930s and show that these ideas were already being accepted and taught in Catholic seminaries. What they're not seeing is what Ernst Haeckel points out in his book of 1906, that the seminaries were already infected with these errors at the dawn of the 20th century. So the theological manuals of the 20s and 30s are not what we need to go back to. We need to go back to the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, where the dogma of creation is clearly explained. Because when Vatican I handed down that very important anathema, that if anyone says that any doctrine of the faith, and they specifically name creation, must be changed because of the progress of science, let him be anathema. And how was the dogma of creation defined at that precise moment? It was defined in the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, because blessed Pope Pius IX and Pope Leo XIII and Pope St. Pius X made the Catechism of Trent the gold standard for teaching and preaching the Catholic faith throughout the entire world. So, this is what our Catholic brothers and sisters all over the world need to understand. We can't go back to the theological manuals of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s as if everything was perfect before the Second Vatican Council. That is a deception. We have to recognize that Lucifer and the demons who never sleep had a long-range strategy which they got off the ground back in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And it only culminated with the full-blown evolution-based modernist assault led by the so-called experts of Vatican II. Yeah, if you ever want to read a book on uh, problems before Vatican II, read uh, Philip Hughes' book on the councils. You got these guys, ah, it's, you know, sunshine lollipops before Vatican II. Yeah, Pius IX wrote that syllabus of errors because everything was so good, right? Thought about moving to Quebec because Rome was so bad. Anyway, make the Jesuits great again, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Kevin, what are some of the consequences of the theory of evolution that the series talks about? 
Um, so there, there's a lot, but um, I'll talk about um, some. One of the direct consequences of belief in uh, biological evolution is this idea of eugenics, that mankind can direct our own evolutionary fate. And so eugenics, um, once undertaken, was quickly adopted by the Germans. And so this is um, in large part responsible for the atrocities of World War I and World War II. Uh, the Nazis were uh, full-blown evolutionists and eugenicists, and um, they basically took this uh, premise to its logical conclusion that uh, if evolution says that there are some humans that are more evolved than others, then why would we keep the non-evolved humans around? Um, well, this idea, eugenics, although it's commonly not called that anymore, is still um, at play today. I mean, this is the reason why we have so many abortions happening in with respect to um, viewing ultrasounds and other um, tests uh, where the unwanted children can be eliminated. Um, so that is really one thing that the, the series kind of goes into, and I think people will find it very interesting. But uh, in the broader perspective, once a person believes that biological evolution is true, if he's a theist, he essentially believes that God is the one who used this system somehow, and therefore this is God's system. And so if God used evolutionism to create everything, um, then really why wouldn't we sort of apply this concept to everything? And so when you look at, uh, for instance, the German bishops synod um, working document and you see that they're now um, pushing for full-blown acceptance of uh, various sexual deviancies like uh, homosexuality, uh, masturbation, um, you know, uh, cohabitation, uh, etc. What you have here to explain it is this idea that morality can evolve with time. And so this is, if people are wondering how could we get in the situation we're in in the church, it's because people with this idea of evolution have applied evolution to everything, including church doctrine, and they are attempting to evolve it. I just went stupid. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, maybe we could edit that part out. <laughs> Keith, uh, yes, you're there. I'm sorry. I said, yes, sir. Uh, Keith, you're narrator and basically graphic designer as well. Uh, what role was it in your, in the series? How much time did you put into it? Uh, I know we joked text wise that you made like three or four Avenger movies. Um, and what did you learn during this whole process? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm the director and uh, narrator, um, videographer. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, sorry, my uh, computer is going off. Let me just uh, shut this off real quick. Um, so yeah, it was quite a process going from the beginning of this project until uh, the fruition uh, just last month. Initially, we started with the concept of producing 12 episodes that were going to run about 50 minutes a piece. And our initial goal was to be able to get it done within a year. And as, as we progressed, it just became obvious that the episodes were much longer than what they uh, we initially thought. And uh, things were added and of course, you know, all the science data was, uh, constantly coming in. So we had to, uh, update the, the, the videos, uh, as, as the science was coming in as well. So, um, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was a very learning process for me besides the complete crash course in biology, uh, and then being able to animate all of these concepts in a way that are understandable to the general public. Uh, first and foremost, because the concepts to me 
um, were not you know, I, I, I didn't know most of these things that uh, we were delving into. So, you know, when you start animating uh, DNA and being able to explain it, uh, you know, on the molecular structure of things, uh, it was very challenging. I had to understand the science before I could actually go and create something so that everyone else would be able to understand it. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um very challenging and uh one of the things that i think i learned the most is that if you're going to work on a project like this uh, or anything that has to do with the truth and uh, the catholic faith uh, the most important thing is to get a bag of benedictine medals and put it on top of your desktop <laughs> actually uh they got a few of those right now. It's just, yeah, that's that's what I have on my uh, sitting on top of my desktop because uh, I was attacked frequently, and not just me, but you know, even my children and uh, family and everything else. We really struggled through a lot of uh, very intense times, and and I know for a fact that it was demonic uh, oppression. And um, it, it was certainly tied to the work that I've been doing on the Foundations Restored series and, and with the Colby Center. Um, but, uh, you know, Mary wins in the end, right? So, so it's, uh, it's all good. Very good, very good. Uh, Kevin and Hugh, uh, most uh, how do you respond to the common thought of Catholic theologians that say we need to teach theistic evolution? Kevin first. Uh, sure. Um, well, I mean, theistic evolution is essentially all that has been taught in Catholic schools for how many decades now? And so if theistic evolution um, was a good mechanism to be able to kind of keep people in the church, um, then I think we would be seeing a lot more uh, young people in the church than we see right now. Instead, uh, what is happening is people uh, learn theistic evolution. Um, they quickly learn that evolution is a system that attempts to explain everything without God. And they come to the logical conclusion that why do I need God if evolution explains everything? Um, and this is one of the reasons why when you look at surveys of scientists uh, scientists are um, representing atheism at a rate that is incredibly high. It is not even close to the level of the general population. And that's because as uh, these scientists study evolution and as they accept it, um, they abandon their faith. And so the idea that somehow um, this is a good idea to keep pushing evolution on people, uh, far from being the answer, it is in fact one of the main reasons why we're in this state of bleeding in the church that we are right now. You? Yes, I, I, I hardly agree. And what we've noticed is that uh, young people who are taught theistic evolution, as almost all of them are, um, also end up growing up with the idea that some aspects of the church's teaching have had to be changed, have had to be updated, have had to evolve. Um, even if it's just the liturgy that they've grown up with, they see that the liturgy that their grandparents had has been replaced with something new. But they also see that the teaching of the church on many different subjects has, at the very least, been, been modified, if not altogether transformed into something different. And what's happening is the young people are not being nourished spiritually because they are not being given the faith whole and entire, and they're not being given a sacred liturgy in most cases that really teaches the truth, not just through the words of the prayers, but also through the actions of the priest and the actions of the congregation. 
And this results in a situation where the young person is not getting the spiritual nourishment that he or she needs to be able to withstand the temptations and the assaults of the anti-culture of death in which virtually every young person in the Western world is submerged. And so what happens is they can't withstand this onslaught. They fall into sin and then they lose the capacity now to even see the truth, to, to embrace the truth when it's presented to them. So what is the antidote? The antidote is clear. We've seen this used all over the world with young people from all different kinds of cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds. You give them the whole truth of the Catholic faith as it's set forth in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And of course, the new catechism is perfectly sound if it's interpreted in light of the Catechism of Trent and the prior authoritative teaching of the Church. The problem is that the young people who are taught from the 1994 Catechism are usually taught from it as if nothing else mm -hmm. that preceded it is of any importance any longer. Right. And that's a disaster. Or even exists. Or even exists. Yeah. I mean, just, just to give a, a quick example, which is not, which is very closely related to the fundamental teaching of the Church on creation, the 1994 Catechism contains many beautiful teachings on marriage and the family. But do you know that if you look fr from, through that entire Catechism from beginning to end, you will not find one single statement to the effect that husband and wife have distinct God-given roles within the family, that the husband and father is appointed by God to be the spiritual head and leader of his wife and children, and that the wife is appointed by God to be the heart of the family, as Pope Pius XI taught in Casti Canubi, for example, and all the fathers, doctors, popes and council fathers taught before him. So when young people then hear that Pope St. John Paul II spoke of mutual submission of spouses, to them, that means that there is no hierarchy within the family. And what is the result? Total anarchy, chaos, and an epidemic of separation and divorce, annulment on demand in most of the dioceses in this country and in many parts of the Western world. So what we're saying is young people have been cheated. They have been given something less than the Catholic faith, whole and entire, and a sacred liturgy that expresses that integral faith. And what we have found is all you have to do is give young people the Catholic faith whole and entire without any watering down and a sacred liturgy that is part of the authentic liturgical tradition of the Catholic Church of whatever rite. It doesn't have to be the Roman rite. It could be Armenian, Byzantine. It doesn't make any difference. It just has to be an authentic traditional liturgy of the Catholic Church. And a young person who receives these two things, and hopefully along with them, the good example of parents and clergy and teachers who themselves have embraced this truth and applied it in their own lives, and you now have a young person who is ready and willing to commit himself to whatever vocation God has called him to. Your viewers can go to the Kobe Center website, and right on the homepage, there's a short video that Keith made. It's called Kobe Interviews. It's interviews with four Catholic young people. This video was done maybe three years ago, Keith, I think. Uh, I think it was... 
A little more than that, about four, okay. four years maybe, yeah. Okay, so four years ago, at that time, three of these young people were homeschooled high school students. One of them was a university student. Today, four years later, three of the four are in preparation for holy orders or in religious life. The young lady is now a Carmelite nun. The young man who was in University of Aberdeen in Scotland is at the Cistercian Monastery of the Holy Cross in Austria. And the other young man from Kentucky is a novice with the missionaries of St. John the Baptist in Park Hills, Kentucky. So three, of, three, three out of four, and God willing, the fourth may well follow their example if that's God's will for him. Awesome. But these are young people who received the Catholic faith whole and entire, who were given the opportunity to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, and they were given at least some example from those who were entrusted with their formation of a lived expression of this beautiful faith. And this is all that they needed to be able to consecrate themselves totally to God in a world which is hardly distinguishable from Sodom and Gomorrah. I know they were talking about a, now we lost everything, you know, Diane Mercer, I think in her book about seven dates or 10 dates, I think it was. Either way, she talks about how uh, Protestantism was attacked on the church fathers. You had to get rid of the church fathers for Protestantism to keep going. But then with our, with the modernist idea, you have to kill off the language, which kills everything in the religion. So nobody's reading Alphonsus. Priests ain't reading moral theology of Alphonsus. They're not reading Bellarmine. I mean, I mean, I went to a church a couple months ago. I said, hey, I got a guy coming in and talk about Bellman. Who's that? And, you know, how many people knew France of the Sales read two books, Bellman and his bravery? <laughs> or, or Benedict XVI's uh, Benedict uh, catechism. He called it the Can uh, the Cantius, St. John Cantius uh, catechism. So, yeah, I mean, we, we basically put a bullet through ourselves and shot ourselves in the head to get, rid of, to get us in this situation, which brings Kevin as a convert. How do you see it from coming from the outside in? And how did you get involved in this whole uh, series? Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, I grew up uh, a Protestant and um, through um, initially a miracle, I, I kind of started this journey towards trying to find the true church. And for a long time, I completely dismissed the Catholic Church. I didn't even consider it because I had been through university. I'd been um, learning for a long time all of the various aspects of uh, biological evolution, and I came to the conclusion that it's false. And so, I, I, as I said in my introduction, I thought you pretty much had to be an evolutionist to be a Catholic. And so, um, eventually, through various other means, I came to the conclusion uh, that I was essentially on the verge of accepting the Catholic Church as true. I couldn't dismiss it anymore. But at the same time, um, this evolutionism was a major stumbling block. So once I found uh, the Colbe Center, and I recognize that there's, um, you know, awesome Catholics who reject evolution and embrace uh, traditional creationism, um, it really brought down a hurdle for me. So I started getting involved with the Colby Center, started going to the um, leaders retreats. And so it just was kind of a natural fit uh, for me to get involved with this series. Hugh, how convinced are you that this series has potential restoring the foundation of the crumbling church? Um, I'm, I'm convinced that it does from the responses that we've already received mm -hmm. from, from bishops, priests, religious, and lay people who have viewed the series. Uh, the responses that we're getting are confirming that this series has the power, by the grace of God, to convince Catholics of goodwill, even if they have 
a prior bias in favor of evolution. Mm -hmm. That in reality, sound theology, sound philosophy, and sound natural science all confirm the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. So the conviction is, is based on the work that was done over the three and a half years when the whole team labored by the grace of God to anticipate every major objection that could be brought against the truth. But now it's being confirmed again by the actual responses of men and women all over the world who are watching the series and and falling head over heels in love with God all over again because of who they are able now to know that he is with that kind of childlike faith that every Catholic wants to be able to have, but which theistic evolution makes it almost impossible for us to possess. Uh, Doc, you're, what, what's your background, doctor of? I'm a dentist. Oh, okay. Uh, I was going to go, well, how does that have anything, how did, how did that bring to the table uh, the background for the series itself and your professional ways? Sure. Um, so I guess a lot of people don't realize that um, the road to becoming a dentist is just tons of sciences. So, I mean, I had, I was basically uh one course short of a bachelor of science in uh, with a major in biochemistry before I got into dentistry. So, and, you know, I'd taken um, not only biochemistry, but, you know, organic chemistry, genetics, and even in dental school, you're taking uh, a ton of sciences. So it was basically uh, seven years of attempted indoctrination into evolutionary theory as kind of an underlay for so many of the courses I took um, that uh, it just, you know, has given me a pretty good um, formal background in study of uh, evolution. So you guys getting positive feedback all around, uh, Keith, even to you. Have you guys heard anybody come? I mean, I'm sure you got some negative ones. I mean, like, you, how dare you do this? I mean, we started a program in Mount Carmel in, in Denver, and two of the three days uh, – of the of the group meeting there was a fight now if somebody from outside come in and start yelling uh, how much are you getting from that from priests or uh bishops or mainly lay people or scientists etc well uh as far as at least direct communications with us through the website or through our social media platforms we actually have had exactly zero negative commentary uh, to this point. Um, <clears throat> I have been seeing on the Twitter account that there have been, you know, where we're being mentioned in, in certain discussions and everything like that, uh, but nothing negative in regards to what we've actually put forth, which, which is fantastic. So, um, and, and that's part of the reason why we decided to give away the first two videos for free because there's so much covered in the first two and a half hours of the 18 and a half hour uh, series mm -hmm. that will really just kind of scratch the surface, but at the same time, just kind of open everyone's eyes to say, Hey, you know what, what let's, let's actually take this serious because it is, we're all indoctrinated with it. Um, maybe not, not all of us, but uh, anyone in the public education system, uh, even in uh, most home schools and everything else, we're indoctrinated with this uh, methodology that, you know, we all evolved. And uh, in the Catholic Church, especially, um, the idea that's pushed forward is theistic evolution, which is completely ridiculous because anyone in the scientific community will completely uh, disavow theistic evolution. It's, it's completely absurd in the actual scientific realm uh, in public school and everything else, even, even Ken Miller. And yeah, we, we kind of attack him a bit in the series because yes. he's a self-professed Catholic, uh, but he, uh, you know, he is in line with, the nat naturalistic approach to uh, origins. And so... Um, 
it's right justice to do that. <laughs> well, it's in charity, really. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's no uh, hard feelings towards him as as a person in his soul, but as just his ideas that that we we actually attack. But um, but as far as the positive feedback that we've received, I've actually got the there's there's a few uh, reviews that we've had off the website here, and uh, we also show some of some of the reviews that we have from. Uh, some bishops and priests and, and a few other people that are well-known. Uh, but in addition to that, I'll, I'll just read one of them here from the website, uh, and I'm not sure the person's name. Uh, they just have their, their username here. But they said, uh, they gave a five-star review, and they said, aptly named for Foundations Restored is exactly what it does. And he's got that all in caps. I've heard many of the arguments in this excellent presentation before, but never so completely, so thoroughly, even astonishingly presented. I've asked a trained geneticist, biologist, and geologist to view the program. All acknowledged foundations restored as completely accurate and reliable in its presentations, with a geologist noting newfound discomfort at beliefs he had long held. How good is this? I've long had problems accepting the 6,000-year biblical history. I don't anymore. The arguments supporting the Christian origin story are highly credible from a scientific perspective, more so than I ever would have believed. I've recommended that my parish incorporate the series into their RCIA program. If you have not heard these arguments before, get ready for an eye-opening experience that may very well change the way you view the world. It is that compelling. It's a tour de force. Your entire family should watch this presentation together because it is phenomenal. And that's just one of a few different ones that we have on the website. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you guys read uh, it was it uh, Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma? Yes. So, all right. His part on evolution. I've gotten a little bi- battle with some people before on this. His, he, it seems like it goes from one to don't to back up, and he's just all over the place. We were thinking that he was probably just at the beginning of all this whole confusion, that he just threw that in there just to, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't seem like it should be even belong in his book. What, what do you guys say about that part? Because a lot of people bring up, hey, well, Ott said this. Look, at here's the pages. I, I think that if you can go to the newsletter – and all the Kolbe newsletters are on the Kolbe website. If you can go to the newsletter that was published uh, last Saturday, um, which is the last newsletter on the website on Ernst Haeckel, it really explains everything because Haeckel's evolution's greatest triumph had already taken place in 1906. Mm-hmm. And evolution's greatest triumph was when the intellectual elite of the Catholic Church compromised and made peace with molecules to man evolution. So, believe it or not, Ludwig Gott came on the scene with his fundamentals of of Catholic dogma decades after most Catholic intellectuals had already made their peace at a minimum with the long ages of Lyellian geology, with the idea that some kind of, you know, cosmology over long ages of time could be true, and that even some kind of evolution up to the human body could be reconciled with the Catholic faith. So it really shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that Ludwig Ott opened up to all kinds of evolutionary possibilities. But it is a terrible mistake to take the theological manuals or the works on dogmatic theology of the 20s or 30s as the gold standard for teaching and preaching because evolution's greatest triumph had occurred by the end of the 19th century. That a uh, priest... Uh, right, me said he heard from another priest that it, was, it shouldn't be violence. It sh- it was it unpious? To, it should be violent to pious ears to think that Our Lady came from an ape. And he told me to read Ott. I'm like, 
I think it just shows how how far we have fallen away from the mind and heart of the fathers and doctors. Yeah. Um, one of the points that we made in the last newsletter, which is so important, is that in the aftermath of Vatican I, before evolution's greatest triumph, you can read, for example, the dogmatic theology of Matthias Schieben, one of the greatest experts in dogma in the entire Catholic Church. And when he sets forth the Catholic doctrine of creation, he explicitly teaches that God created every different kind of plant and animal and Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side, exactly as related in the sacred history of Genesis. Mm -hmm. He doesn't make any reference to the Fourth Lateran Council, which gave us the most important dogmatic definition of the doctrine of creation. He doesn't make any reference to the First Vatican Council, which reaffirmed the Firmiter of Lateran IV. Why? Because at that point, it was the mind of the church and of all the learned and great teachers of the church that Genesis was the sacred history. And if Moses said X, Y, or Z, all you needed to do was to say Moses says X and that settles the argument. Mm -hmm. Or he says Y or he says Z. When evolution's greatest triumph occurred, all of a sudden, it wasn't good enough that Moses said that God created Adam, body, and soul, or that Moses said that God created Eve literally from Adam's side, or that Moses said that God created all the different kinds of plants on the third day of creation. So what happened? Now you had the theologian saying, well, where's the magisterial statement? that confirms that this is really the teaching of the church. Where's the conciliar decree that explicitly states that God created all the different kinds of plants and animals? You see, it really was evolution's greatest triumph because for any theologian who has the reverence for the word of God and for the sacred history of Genesis, that every father of the church and every doctor of the church possessed, it was completely absurd and bordering on blasphemy to say that you had to have some kind of papal bull in order to know that a straightforward proposition given to us by Moses in the sacred history of Genesis had to be believed. We have fallen so far from the attitude and the reverence of our fathers in the faith. And we need to repent, and we need to beg Our Lady to obtain for us a restoration of that true spirit of reverence that we have lost. Uh, is it mostly an Anglo uh, mess up? Or is it, do you see it more like, a, say, Philippines, Africa, South America, North America? Europe, Asia, uh, do you see like one group more prevalent in, oh yeah, we'll do theistic evolution, evolution, yeah, yeah. And do you see another group, say Filipinos or Africans, the opposite? Well, Europe is definitely the worst, but of all the regions of the world, and by the grace of God, we have been able to visit every continent except for Antarctica with this message and we we have to say that africa is the exception and we believe we firmly believe that the church in africa and especially in east africa can turn things around because the african people have been in many ways the primary victims of this evolutionary mythology you know, the first genocide of the 20th century 
was not the Armenian genocide. It was the African genocide in Namibia in the beginning of the 20th century, when in the scramble for colonies, the German military who went down into what is now Tanzania, Cameroon, Namibia, these people were firmly convinced that evolution was a fact. And they considered the Africans to be a missing link between apes and humans. And that if these people did not do exactly what they were told, they should be exterminated. And there were whole tribes like the Herero in Namibia that were almost completely wiped off the face of the earth by these evolution believing military leaders who fully embraced the evolutionary ideology that was then put into practice by the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. So Africans have a special reason to question the truth of the molecules to man evolution ideology. But there is also another very important reason why we believe that the church in Uganda in particular has a very special role in the restoration of the true Catholic doctrine of creation. Because the first missionaries to what is now the nation of Uganda arrived in, eight, in the late 1870s, just before evolution's greatest triumph. <laughs> they were sent there when the Catholic Church was still uniformly defending at the highest levels, yeah. the true doctrine of creation. And so the Catholics of what is now Uganda received the seed of the faith pure. And when you read the lives of the holy Uganda martyrs who were tortured to death or burned alive for their witness to the Catholic faith in the mid 1880s, you see that they were taught by those missionaries that every word of the sacred history of Genesis is true. In fact, those holy Uganda martyrs died for the literal historical truth of Genesis because when the first missionaries arrived in what was then the kingdom of Uganda, which has now become the Republic of Uganda, every distorted view of marriage was being practiced and promoted. The, the people of the kingdom had a memory of the one true God and of a time when their ancestors were monogamous and practiced a very strict code of sexual morality. But they, they recognized and they practiced a degenerate form of that original religion, which had degenerated into polytheism with polygamy and human sacrifice. Then you had Muslim traders who came into the kingdom from Zanzibar to do business and brought with them not just polygamy and the acceptance of slavery, but also homosexuality. And it's a fact that the Kabaka or king of the kingdom of Uganda became addicted to homosexual vice. And his successor continued to be addicted to homosexual vice and interestingly enough, addicted to the smoking of marijuana. And this was the proximate cause of the martyrdom of the Holy Uganda martyrs because the core of the new church in Uganda was led by St. Charles Luanga, who had a position as a sort of manager of the young men who were sent to the court of the Kabaka, the king, to be prepared for positions of leadership within the kingdom. And he understood very well that God created Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side, one man for one woman for life. So all the first Catholics, if they were married, as a few of the holy martyrs were, they had to put aside all their wives but one. And if they were not married, they understood 
they had to be perfectly chaste until they entered into holy matrimony, if that was their vocation. Now keep in mind, the Kabaka had something like five, six, seven hundred wives. And most of these, many of these women were wandering around the court trying to seduce these young men. Then they had a king whose word was supposed to be law, who was trying to get them to practice homosexual vice. Mm -hmm. And then they had Protestant missionaries coming in and trying to turn the Kabaka against the Catholics who accepted divorce and remarriage. And what did these men do? They held fast. They believed what they were taught, that God created one man for one woman for life from the beginning. And they literally were willing to be tortured to death or burned alive rather than deviate from that teaching drawn from the literal historical truth of the sacred history of Genesis. And today, the Holy Uganda Martyrs Shrine mm -hmm. in Namgongo, a suburb, suburb of the capital city, Kampala, is the greatest Catholic place of pilgrimage in sub-Saharan Africa. Every year, hundreds of thousands more pilgrims converge on that place to celebrate the Feast of the Holy Martyrs. Last year, I believe there were four million pilgrims. And many of these Catholics walk 150, 200, 250 miles every single year as pilgrims to go to that place to honor the sacred memory of the Holy Uganda Martyr. That's amazing. And we have found the greatest reception on the face of the earth from the bishops and priests and religious of the church, the Catholic Church in Uganda. And uh, Bishop Sanctus Wanak, the Bishop of the Diocese of Lira, is publishing the teacher's guide for the DVD series in his diocese with his imprimatur. Oh, nice. And we are convinced that the church in Uganda can turn things around, can become the leader if among all the churches to restore the foundations of the faith. And I like to point out that in the time of the Aryan crisis, Father Jurgens tells us that 97% of all the bishops were in communion hmm. with Aryan heretics. It doesn't mean they were teaching the Aryan heresy, but they were willing to go along with it. And it's okay. Why? Because they, they wanted to they wanted to, to, to make peace yeah. with the emperor and have peace, not be in a war with the world. And what do we have today? We have something like that willing to be at, at peace with theistic evolution, even if they don't personally embrace it or teach it. Yeah. Well, where was St. Athanasius, the leader of those who defended the divinity of Christ? He was at the mouth of the Nile River in Alexandria, Egypt. And where is the church in Uganda? Where is the Holy Martyr Shrine? It's at the source of the Nile River. So in the previous worst crisis of faith in the history of the church, it was an African bishop at the mouth of the Nile River who led the defense of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we believe it will be the Ugandan bishops at the source of the same river who are going to lead the defense of the true Catholic doctrine of creation that is the foundation of our faith. And as always, we'll have the links down in the show notes section so you get the first two episodes for free. But uh, if you want to read more on what Hugh's talking about, uh, Simeon Lor Lordell, planting the, planting the Faith in the Furthest Africa, uh, book Ryan, my bud Ryan Grant uh, republished. He goes into how bad, how brutal those martyrdoms were on St. Charles, etc. Yeah. Uh, uh, back, back to the the DVD series. Is there a um, uh, is there a goal to put it in different languages, translations? Yes. Um, thanks to Keith Jones's brother Jeff, 
we have a complete transcript of the entire DVD series, and we already have people working on translations into Spanish, German, French, Polish, and as of yesterday, Croatian. But if there's anybody in the audience that would be willing and able to make a good translation into another language, please get in touch. We would love to give you the complete transcript so that you can translate it into other languages. I may have a guy that could do that to me if that's a big issue there. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Uh, Vietnam was devastated by evolution-based communism. Our Lady of Fatima said the errors of Russia would spread if her requests were not heeded. And the Russian communists were the principal sponsors of communism all over the world. Where did Ho Chi Minh go? Mm -hmm. He went to the Russian communists, and they were the ones who trained him. But what was the foundation of Russian Soviet communism? It was evolution. It was evolution that made Lenin and Stalin confident communists because they were confident evolutionists, which made them confident atheists, which made them confident co communists. And, and that's the same education or miseducation that they gave to Ho Chi Minh. So it would be very fitting for the Vietnamese people to be liberated from this bondage to this evolutionary mythology which has caused them so much misery. I'll try to get his contact info to you so you guys can talk about that. Great. Uh, final thoughts, Keith. Uh, final thoughts on everything and then future-wise. Uh, well, we're just really excited that the response that we've had to the DVD series so far has been very positive. Um, uh, we actually haven't spent a single dollar in advertising yet although we plan to do so in the future but it's just been the word of mouth and everyone else everyone's starting to get their physical dvds we we had a, a delay in our manufacturer that produced the dvds and actually getting getting them to us on time uh very very delayed we were supposed to have them um at the end of last month and we actually just got them i think in stock last week so uh, we've been pushing really hard to get everyone their DVDs, but people are starting to receive them, and uh, everyone's taking pictures of it when they get it uh, when they get it in, and they're posting it on on social media, saying, "I'm so excited to get this." Um, the online streaming has been uh, going very well for for most people. We've had some server issues, but uh, we're trying to to get all those situated. Um, so yeah, it's been. Um, it's been fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't be more happy about the response that we've actually had uh, for the series. And moving forward, uh, at least with the Colby Center, we we have some things that are in preliminary conceptualization phases right now uh, in regards to what we're going to move into next. Uh, aside from uh, improving upon the foundations restored as far as translations and that sort of thing. But uh, we want to get into doing some things for children as well because the series that we have right now is currently more focused towards the high school, college level, uh, and above. Uh, and uh, first and foremost in developing the education for our children uh, that's where they get attacked the most is where they are taught from a very early age in any book that they pick up from the library on dinosaurs or whatever. It, the first line in the book, million, millions and millions of years ago. And uh, that needs to change uh -huh. uh, because, you know, uh, Catholic parents, they don't have anywhere else to turn to other than, public library or, or anything that, it, that is available, uh, even, even from the Catholic Church, that would, which is pushing theistic evolution. So uh, that's where we would like to be able to move. And uh, of course, with children, um, I, I think that the easiest way to be able to 
produce something that they are interested in is, is through animation. And so I'm working um, with you and, and with others to be able to come up with something that will address that, but not in a, a cheesy way either, because it has to be of the same caliber and it has to be of the same quality and the same content that they're getting from you know, all the other platforms out there, Disney or whoever it may be. So, um, yeah, so I'm excited about it, and and I think that uh, if anyone is interested in having or, or expressing their thoughts and their ideas, uh, that they should contact you uh, through the Colby Center dot org to give them their thoughts and uh, their ideas, and if they're interested in helping out in our next phase that we're going into, that would be much appreciated. We've been talking so long. Hugh grew a cattail. That's how much he's evolved in the last hour. <laughs> this is Ivan. And he's firmly convinced of creation. <laughs> uh, Dr. Mark, same question to you. Um, I'm just excited about this series, and I just want to encourage people to go to that website, foundationsrestored.com, and either get the online version or order your DVD copy, because this series, it really does have the potential to change your life, to completely change your perception of God, of who he is, of what the church stands for, getting rid of these errors and bringing you to a better understanding of the truth. And so I can't really think of any other series that is as good and as important as this one. So please go to that website, check it out. If you already know about it, let others know about it. Yes, and also if you type in the code census fidelity, you got to spell it right, all one word, 10% off. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to add uh, to that. I'm sorry. I, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> Back to <First>, you. <laughs> Hugh, any final thoughts? I'd just like to thank God for all the people who have prayed for us and continue to pray for us because we wouldn't have been able to do anything without the help of so many prayers, uh, especially of consecrated religious, like the uh, Benedictines uh, of Mary in Gower and, and many others um, all over the world. And um, and what we, we would especially appreciate is, is if you would continue to, to pray for us, pray for the success of this mission and pray about how you might be able to use this DVD series in your local area. The teacher's guide really makes it very easy for any Catholic to lead a very fruitful prayer and discussion group where you could get together, pray, watch an episode of the DVD series, and then have a very fruitful discussion and uh, pray again at the end. So if you can get permission from your pastor or from some other Catholic venue, or even have the meeting in your home, you could do so much good for so many souls by using this DVD series in this way. So that's the last thing that I'd like to uh, encourage listeners and viewers to do very good again the website is www.foundationsrestored.com can you get the uh teachers guide on the same website um i believe so is that can you not keith yeah you can yeah you can you can uh well it's not sold separately it's sold as part of the package so if you buy the online streaming version uh it'll come as a pdf download uh, if you buy the physical copy, then you'll actually get the, the spiral bound version of it. Yeah. Very good. Again, we'll have the links below in the show notes, description section, scroll underneath, click it, use the coupon code for 10% off census fidelium. And yeah, to keep spreading the word and, uh, give it for, uh, Easter's coming up. Give it some Easter gifts. <laughs> oh, that's what I wanted to mention actually was that, uh, when I lost my train of thought earlier is that, 
Uh, we also have the option for purchasing gift certificates. And, and right now we just have it for the online streaming uh, version because it's different as far as shipping is actually concerned if they're buying the physical DVDs. But you can buy, buy a gift certificate for uh, a, a family member, a friend, a priest, uh, or even an enemy. Uh, and you can buy the, the online streaming version uh, as a gift certificate. And then when you actually check out, you can just put their information in their email address and then we'll actually send it directly to them. And then they can go to the website and be able to check out and basically uh, get the series uh, at no cost if you, if you want to purchase it for somebody else. So, Awesome. Very good. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll end in the glory be and uh, we'll get on with the yeah. night. Father, so Son, Holy you. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, as, it, was, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now and never, never shall, shall be. The world without in. Amen. God and martyrs, pray for us. Pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Steve. God Thank bless you. you. Thanks for having us. On one side, spiritual freedom and truth Reason and culture, evolution and progress stand under the bright banner of science. On the other side, under the black flag of hierarchy, stand spiritual slavery and falsehood, irrationality and barbarism, superstition and retrogression. Evolution is the heavy artillery in the struggle for truth. True and enduring peace there cannot be until one of the combatants lies powerless on the ground. Either the church wins, and then farewell to all free science and free teaching, or else the modern rational state proves victorious. Then, in the 20th century, human culture, freedom, and prosperity will continue their progressive development. Current evolutionary theories are proclaimed as beyond question in the name of science, but a closer look reveals the reasons for adherence to the paradigm are philosophical rather than empirical. While truth cannot contradict truth, bad science tends to follow bad philosophy, and this is what we see again and again in the writings of Kenneth Miller and other leading evolutionists. It too has turned out at last to be no more than a godless ideology masquerading in scientific God. Here's a simple way of saying it. We're not going up, we're not evolving upward, we're going down. Given the real testimony of the fossil record, most of the geologic column is best interpreted as being laid down quickly and as a result of a global flood. No scientist would ever accept divine intervention in the formation of the first humans, and yet theistic evolution has little meaning if God is fenced out.